Hi everyone, I hope you're having a lovely Easter holiday and doing plenty of revision for your up and coming criminology exams. This one is for unit four and it is the final topic, it is 3.3. .3. So let's get started. Three point three then is examine the limitations of agencies in achieving social control. So limitations means weaknesses. Um, so it's about evaluating the social control and the agencies' um, actions within these. You should be able to examine the limitations of agencies in achieving social control, including repeat offenders and recidivism, civil liberties and legal barriers, access to resources and support, finance, local and national policies, environment and crime committed by those with moral imperatives. So the first thing I get my students to do is I get them to write a list of as many reasons why the following agencies might fail to achieve their aims. So this is the final topic. We've covered all of these areas now in great depth and detail. So I just get my students to write a list of reasons why they might fail. So why do prisons fail? Why do community sentences, community service fail? Why do CBOs fail? CBOs, don't forget, uh, community behaviour orders are what replaced ASBOs um, or antisocial behaviour orders. So repeat offending or recidivism. The limitations of agencies seeking to gain social control can be seen clearly in the rates of reoffending. And so I get my students to look at a table with all the facts and information on and get them to use this, but I've given you the same information on this slide as well to help you at home. Um, here are some of the facts and figures about recidivism rates or reoffending rates. In 2017, 30% of people who had been released from prison, given a fine, warning, community or suspended sentence, reoffended within 12 months. That's half a million new offences being committed. A person who reoffends on average commits four more offences. The number of reoffences per offender has been rising since 20 uh, so, since 2009. Recidivism rates just for people released from prison was 37.5 in 2017. 48% of women released from prison reoffend within a year. 64.1% for those who had been given a short sentence, so less than 12 months. 40% of young offenders reoffend within 12 months. 68% of young offenders released from custody reoffend within a year. 74 of young offenders are given a very short sentence, so below six months reoffend. And so, what I get them to do is to draw conclusions about from these statistics. What do these statistics imply about the agencies and what the agencies are doing to help social control? Clearly, social control is not here. If there's so much reoffending going on, that this is if you reoffend, if you are committing crimes, that means that there's lack of social control. So there's a lack of social control in these statistics. So what are the problems with the agencies? Um, and then how might social learning theory and labelling explain these facts? and figures as well. So that's a synoptic link from unit two. My advice when it comes to this is know, know at least four or five of these statistics because it could be a nine marker question which means that you need to have statistics to back up what you are arguing. You also must talk about how these shows limitations. So for so what it shows is the short sentences. So, so many of these are short sentences. So, um, at least from custody. So at least the 64.1% with short sentences, the young offenders, uh, no, not that one. So short sentences, the last one with the short sentences, re-offend. Um, people, um, you know, uh, the community sentences um, and people released from prison, etc. So it shows that short sentences don't work because there's not time to rehabilitate them. Why is 48%? That's nearly half of women released re-offend. Why? Is it because of this idea of labelling theory have now have they now become criminal in their labels you are an ex-criminal you've been to prison they, they now have that label so they think well might as well you know keep committing crimes now is it because of something like that so how and, and this just become part of their 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 um master status are they just now a criminal they can't break through that so just commit keep committing crimes because of it so talk about 
the limitations, talk about how the short sentences, the limitation is that they can't be rehabilitated. Um, talk about the, the fact that there's a lack of jobs once you've been given that label and so therefore the only way of doing it is by committing more crimes, etc. So knowing your statistics is of utmost importance because you can use these in so many of the other areas as well. The consequences of these recidivism rates are that the population of people in prison has become very high. The Prison Reform Trust says that it's doubled since 1993 and the repeat offending of many people has contributed to this. However, a greater contributor to the rise in population is the fact that longer sentences are now being given. For instance, in 2018, an average sentence for a serious crime was an average 26 months longer than 10 years before. The average minimum sentence for murder was 12.5 years in 2003, and that's rose to 21.3 years in 2016. So what that means is, is not only have you got the repeat offenders going in and out and flip-flopping backwards and in and out of prison, you've also got the people in there for longer terms. So the prisons are bulging, the prisons are very 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 high in their population who is more likely to reoffend? then evidence suggests it's higher if you have reoffended before maybe because of labeling you are male even though 48 percent of women reoffend. you have been given a prison sentence rather than caution fine or community sentence even though statistics on the other slide also question those areas you are a drug or alcohol addiction you are homeless well, would you rather be in prison or on the streets? In prison, you get shelter, food. You have few qualifications and are unemployed. And again, this is the idea that if you are unemployed, you have very little to lose. You can't lose your job. So... Um, the students, my students and I watch different clips of like antisocial or bad behaviour, especially to sort of police. And I say to them, I said, it, I wouldn't want to, but I could never behave in that manner. I could never vandalise a police car. I could never um, shout and swear at a police officer because I'd lose my job or I'd get a serious slap on the wrist. I wouldn't do that because I have too much to lose. If you don't have a lot to lose, then why not turn to crime? And again, I get my students to outline why each of these plays a factor um, towards the, the issues with social control. How would the following theories explain these factors and who is more like of who is sorry, should be of who is more likely to reoffend? And so what would Marxism and right realists say? So Marxism again, the idea that if you're kept in a certain position and place and you're not you're working hard but getting very little money for the hard work you're doing, you're gonna fight back, and maybe this is their way of fighting back. Civil liberties and legal barriers. In some countries, there are few civil liberties, rights and freedoms given to all people in the country by law. Some countries are police states. Virtually no limitations on what the police are permitted to do to ensure all people conform to the law. Police states, places like Saudi Arabia, they are very much run by the police. You do not want to mess with them because they have very little limitations. They're very much... Uh, uh, crime control area they will really step in to sort out the crime um, and so you are guilty before you are innocent so for example turkey the state has committed um the state has committed arbitrary killing and suspicious deaths of people in custody, forced disappearances, torture, arbitrary, arbitrary meaning random, arbitrary arrest and detention of tens of thousands of persons, including opposition MPs, lawyers and journalists for peaceful, legitimate speech. And this was um, a US Department of State report on human rights in 2018. So basically, they can just arrest anybody they want to, anybody they don't like, anybody that causes them problems. And these people disappear. The organisation Amnesty International campaigns to end such human rights abuses through peaceful means such as letter writing to heads of state politicians and justice departments. In most countries, however, certain fundamental freedoms and civil liberties are upheld by law. So at this stage, I get my students to try and work out what civil liberties do we have protected by law? What things do we have uh, that we are allowed to do? So it's quite tricky to think of them, but then when you see them, it's like, oh, of course we have those. So there are six. See if you can think of any civil liberties, that any freedoms as a society, as individuals that we have, that we are allowed to uphold. So see if you can think of any.
All right, the answers are freedom of speech, including in the press, freedom of assemble, including to protest peacefully, freedom of movement, minus when we're in lockdown COVID, freedom of arbitrary arrest, so we are free from being randomly arrested. That's why when you are arrested in this country, they will say, I am arresting you on suspicion of blah, blah, blah. If they don't have suspicion of blah, 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 they can't arrest you. There has to be a reason they are arresting you. Freedom from being detained without a trial. Um, this is this is was all brought in, or a lot of this was brought in after the Pace case. So please do have a look at um, the Maxwell Confit case and how the boys were treated, and then how afterwards uh, Pace was brought in to protect people that have been arrested. Freedom of religion and conscience. These freedoms are also part of the thinking behind the due process model of justice. Due process, um, as we've said, is the opposite of crime control, where you are given the due process in finding you guilty or innocent. And so I get my students to recall what they can remember about the due process model. How does it relate to civil liberties listed above? So again, worthwhile, do, uh, worthwhile doing because again, it is on a year exam due process so it's always good to have it as your synoptic links and deeper understanding which theories of criminality might support the existence of civil liberty and human rights laws so why could civil liberties be a limitation to achieving social control because that's the crux of this isn't it that's what we need to discuss is how do these then limit what police can do what agencies can do how do these limit social control so maybe get some examples of protests of how people assemble and they're maybe not so peaceful freedom of speech how does that cause problems so think about the limitations of these research and make notes on the case of abu Qatada um, to see how this might be an issue in practice access to resources and support um, one of the limitations to achieving social control in terms of rehabilitating offenders is the lack of access to resources and support. This can be both within prison and once an offender is released. So I get my students to do a quick cut and stick to work out which are the limitations that are in prison, which are the limitations when they've been released from prison. However, of course, I've given you the answers all here. So within prison, the limitations, short sentences, there are not enough time with short sentences sentences less than 12 months to train, access education, drug, re drug rehabilitation programs. Basically, you can't do anything with anyone on a short sentence. The Bromley Briefings Prison Fact File 2016, check that out if you've not already. It's Googleable, you can get the PDF. Highly recommend you look at that. Said that in 10 of the 34 adult male prisons um, weren't engaging prisoners in education, vocational training due to staff shortages, poor organisation, and not challenging non attendance. So Basically, prisons have turned into a bit of like schools. People don't turn up. There's a lack of staff to do it. There's poor organisation in setting it up. So basically, it has become a little bit by school. Lack of resources for training. 2018 report on prisons by the chief inspector said that 50% of prisons were failing to provide inmates with useful, meaningful activity each day. There's hardly enough prison officers to watch the people inside prison already without trying to then provide them meaningful and useful activities. Because obviously, as we know, we lost 20,000 um, uh, uh, police officers. Um, I can't remember the statistic for how many prison officers. I, I know there was a huge budget cut in that area as well. There were a lot of um, long withstanding prison um, officers left. Um, and so if you have a lack of staff... Uh, but you have an immense amount of inmates, of course you're not going to be able to give them useful and meaningful activity because you haven't got the staff to facilitate that because they're just spending all of their time ground controlling the criminals so that they don't misbehave in prison. Lack of staff, there we go. 15% fewer offices means staffing of meaningful rehabilitation is difficult. Prisoners have been locked up in their cells earlier if they aren't enough staff to supervise activities. So basically they're locked in their cells because... They can't facilitate them being out of their cells. 
Three quarters of prisons inspected by Ofsted were judged, so just like schools, were judged as inadequate or requiring improvement. 51% of prison inmates had literacy skills of an 11 year old compared with 15% of the general population. So it's kind of a vicious cycle, isn't it, really, that people, as we saw in the previous couple of slides ago, that people that are unemployed or lack skills, lack qualifications, um, often tend to go in prison, but then they're not then helped in prison once they're there because there's not the facilities to do it. So then they go back out. They still have lack of skills, so therefore commit crimes again to go back in prison. On release from prison, lack of money. Prisoners cannot earn very much while in prison and only a £46 grant when released, which is the same amount since 1997. Many are not eligible for this, such as those in prison for less than 15 days, those on remand and those who have defaulted on a fine. So basically, when you're released from prison, you're given very, very little to help you get back on your feet. And um, for some people, they don't get anything. They don't have a job. Only a quarter of released prisoners have a job to go to because obviously if they lack literary skills when they go in, they don't get any training when they're in there and therefore still have no skills when they come out. They can't then get jobs. And who is going to hire a criminal when they've got that label? Very, very hard for them to get jobs and get themselves back on the straight and narrow. Homelessness. Um... Tenancies have often ended while a person is in prison um, as housing benefit only lasts for 13 weeks of imprisonment. So basically, people lose their homes when they've been in prison. They only keep them for so long until they'll give it to another family, uh, another individual. And so um, NACRO says that one in nine prisoners have no accommodation on release because they've lost it while in prison. Being released on a Friday, now when I read that one I thought, why on earth would being released on a Friday be a problem? But it is actually a huge issue. Um, what it means is when they are released on a Friday, it gives them very little time to sort things out before the weekend, accommodation, benefits, medications. So basically at the weekend, everything like that shuts down people that don't work weekends. And so there is an end Friday releases campaign to try and end this practice as it can lead to homelessness and sometimes people being tempted to commit crimes in order to acquire the basics or even go back in prison where at least they will have shelter and food. Community sentences, these are generally more effective than prison sentences, but there is still some re-offenders, 34%. There is a lack of support, supervision by probation services and CRCS. CRCS. Can't remember, we did look that one up. CR, let me just quickly Google No, it was something community. Community Rehabilitation Company. So CRCs is Community Rehabilitation Company. Number four, finance. As we have seen, funding is crucial to services being able to work effectively. Services that are publicly funded out of taxpayers' money will always have limitations on what they are able to do with the budgets they are awarded. But in recent years, these budgets have been cut, as in all areas, NHS teaching, all um, taxpayer funded areas have been cut and so um, and prisons is one of those areas and so because of that social control is more difficult to control as a consequence and so what I get my students to do I they have these again on a table and they have to link each one to how it's a limitation what it implies what it means what knock-on effects it has so these don't link to the limitations but you need to use this information in here to see what limitations of the different agencies so police is an agency CPS is an agency how do these pause how do these six pause limitations on social control? So 2010 to 2018, the budget was cut by 19%. So there's 20,000 fewer police officers. National shortage of detectives. Evidence that cases have been dropped, especially sexual assault and violent attacks, because these take much longer to solve. They're far harder to solve as well. Um, often you've got one 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 person against another person often the evidence is lacking and so far, so therefore they're hard to solve and uh, less likely to actually be successful when going to court so therefore they just 
get dropped. And then again, that leads then to the vicious cycle and then people don't report these, then sexual assault goes uh, uh, unreported, etc, etc. And 2018 to 20, uh, 20 and 2018, budget cuts for the CPS was 25%. They lost a third of their staff. So don't forget the CPS are who help the police. They're the ones that look at all of the cases and whether they should go to Crown Court or Magistrates Court. They, they're the ones that really work out how to save money. But if they've lost a third of their staff, that means the staff that they've got have still got the same amount of cases that's always going up they're going to make mistakes they're not going to you know they, they're not going to work very well under the workload and what it also means is mis um, yeah mistakes can be made but the, the staff are also going to be very unhappy they'll just leave 2018 head of cps said many cases are not being investigated properly including rape fraud slavery and police and the cps are critically short of resources to challenge and deal with crime so that again means that if criminals know they're not getting checked there's less risk in doing a crime. It also means that when these things are getting investigated properly, rapists are on the street, fraudsters are on the street, slavery will continue. So again, the social control is limited. Also, criticism of the CPS is downgrading charges so that cases are dealt with in the magistrate's court instead of the Crown Court because it's quicker and cheaper. This may mean people have lighter sentences and so they're back on the streets quicker, committing the crimes again because of recidivism rates, and therefore social control is not being kept. If they know I can do these crimes, but it's just going to go to the magistrates, I'm only going to get uh, you know a few months rather than what I would normally have got. There's there's less punishment. There's less. Um, reason for them not to commit the crime and so therefore again social control is not being kept prisons and probation service prisons 2010 to 2018 budgets fell by 16 percent 2016 house of commons briefing paper on the police showed funding from central government had decreased by 25 percent from 2010 to 2014 um, so the local government funds um, more of the police from the council tax payments so again the money that we pay staff levels fell by 15 percent and many more experienced prison, prison officers have left so Again, this is why rehabilitation is not happening. This is why it's disorganised. This is why they're failing Ofsted because they've lost 15% of their staff. Many more experienced prison officers have left as well. That means that people that have maybe taken early retirement, um, maybe more experienced police staff, prison officers have left as well because they can't handle the amount of extra work. So therefore, I've just thought it's time for me to find another job. But the biggest worry with that is more experience means that you can handle situations better. Less experienced newbies don't necessarily have that um, initiative that is built up over years. Losing experienced staff is a huge worry. Rising levels of assault, self-harm and suicides in prisons, overcrowding is an issue, lack of ability to properly rehabilitate and primary run prisons may compound the issue, make it worse. HMP Birmingham had a serious riot in 2016 because of lack of staffing but it also means that prisons then become a far more dangerous place and so people are less likely to become prison officers then because of the the risk of who you are then dealing with and if you haven't got the backup from other other staff members it's a very frightening thing to go into is a prison with criminals when there's a lot of them one of you it will put people off wanting to go into the system probation service a national shortage of staff and an over-reliance on agency staff. What that means is, or I have put uh, CRCs there, I knew I'd put it somewhere. Um, over-reliance on agency staff. Agency staff means there's a very high turnover of different staff, which means that nobody stays with the same people, that they'll always have a different person dealing with the case. That means, again, mistakes get made, and people can't have a continuous relationship. And if you're working with someone on probation, you want the same person to be working with you. You don't want to, hi, I'm Sue, hi, I'm Sandra, hi, I'm Sally, and I'm Sophie. You, you don't want um, a different person every time helping you when you need, but that's what happens when you have agency staff there's no there's no continuity there's no continuation with the same person and what it also means is oh i thought sophie dealt with that the other day oh no i thought sally again mistakes are made things are over overlooked when you have lots of people what it also means is they won't necessarily have the same amount of training or experience as someone that is not on agency 
um, substandard performance of private CRCs, not keeping victims safe. So again, social control, we are at risk and people lack confidence in the service. Um, but of course we do because we're seeing so much recidivism, so much crime, so, so little social control done by ex they're done by re effect you know uh, ex um prison uh, prisoners uh, um and so of course we're then going to lack confidence in the probation service but then of so then the probation service gets a bad name but they're doing everything they can with the amount of staff that they've got how can they do anything more when they don't have the money to fund the staff uh, to actually be able to make it work so so much of this is about the pressure on the individuals that are already in the system so as in the agencies there's so much pressure on them to do so much more work because of the lack of staff and the lack of funding so it's a very undesirable um agencies to be within and no wonder then there are a lot of limitations when it comes to social control Local and national policies, when the government announces a change in priority in terms of policing, this can mean more police time is spent dealing with a particular kind of crime. So as we've known before, this is called um, penal populism. So the idea the government wants to look popular by focusing on knife crime, for example. Less time and resources, therefore, for other kinds of crime. So 2010 to 2015, there was a move by government to focus on tackling gang crime, including knife and gun crime. The government brought in new laws prohibiting involvement, encouragement of, or assistance of violence that is gang related. This seems perfectly appropriate, but the funding given to this meant there was less money to tackle other kinds of crime, like domestic violence and rape. Alongside this drive to tackle gang-related violence, the government in 2019 brought in new rules for police making stop and search for weapons without the need for reasonable suspicion much easier. But what that means is there's a lot of racial targeting then. Um, so this again leads to labelling. If the same people are getting stopped all the time for a stop and search, they'll think, well, I might as well carry a weapon because I'm always stopped and searched. So it doesn't put them off. They just think, well, you already think I'm that criminal, so I might as well become that criminal. This drive to tackle gang violence has involved other agencies as well, such as schools and youth services, to try and prevent and protect children from getting involved in gangs, e.g. trying to include children rather than excluding them from schools. But then again, yes, you shouldn't exclude children from school, but ex ex exclusion from school is an absolute last resort. Do you really want them children in classrooms with all the other children uh, if they are completely unteachable? There are local policies too. For instance, in 2017, the Mayor of London, um, Sadiq Khan, announced policies for tackling hate crime and terrorism. The police can respond locally too. So if someone like county lines or knife crime become a particular local issue, they can have policies for tackling this. Sometimes this may be in response to a local campaign or moral panic on a local or national level. There have been instances of local and national weapons amnesties where people are given the opportunity to hand in illegal weapons without questions being asked. In 2017 in London, a fortnight gun amnesty led to 350 guns and 40,000 rounds of ammunition being surrendered. Now, I think that's brilliant. I think that is so promising that there's 350 less guns on the street there's 40,000 rounds of ammunition less on the streets there's no questions asked obviously people think oh but there's a camera on me somewhere people will still be very suspicious but if that's genuine that you just hand them in no questions nothing's going to happen to you there's no camera seeing who drops what off where um you know it must maybe there's just like a letterbox outside and you just post it through um, or whatever it is that should be done so much more. 2017 in London, no, it should be every year, everywhere in the country. Um, you should be able to do this and to get the weapons off the streets. So I think that's wonderful. I think the limitation is it's obviously not done enough. Police may choose to change the priority of an issue if it's seen as too expensive to police, too trivial or too difficult. So... Too expensive. Too expensive are things like um, things on social media. Um, again, um, 
any anything based or like fraud you you have to have such an understanding and you're then going through all the emails all the conversations all the the messages etc etc like um uh, rape cases that are based from uh, meeting someone on tinder you need so many staff to go through all the immense amount of um media and technology online technology that takes so much time and it's so expensive for the police or having people that are trained to understand high level fraud white collar crime etc is too expensive um too trivial or too difficult that's often seen around your domestic abuse or your rape cases because like i said there's a lack of evidence it's one person's word against somebody else's and the chance of it actually getting a, a going to crown court and getting a long term is very very unlikely so they're just again prioritize other things are prioritized Finally, the environment, oh, I think there might be one more, sorry. The environment a person is released into from prison plays an important role in their likelihood of breaking the law again, an important factor in social control. Too often, however, ex-offenders go back to the same situation as before, back into bad habits, back into crime. So, same circle of friends, same neighbourhood where drug taking or criminal activity may lure them back into all behaviours. So, when you go around the same people, oh, go and you did it for my last time, you were only in prison a few months, go on do it again you won't get caught this time this may especially be true if the person has no employment studies show that 27 percent of released prisoners have jobs and only 12 percent of employers say they've given a job to someone with a criminal record in the past three years the prison reform trust 2016 study showed that if a person goes home to live with family reoffending is lower but only 61 percent do so so very not a lot of people go home but if they do because why you don't want to let your family down again and so there is a reason for you not to commit crime there are people watching you checking up on you and helping you you're not just going back on your own to the same circle of friends and you're lured back in also, if a person has had visits from family while in prison, they are less likely to reoffend, but only 68% have such visits. Again, this then means it doesn't just become about you doing the crime, it becomes about the family that you are hurting. That's a huge pull to draw you out of crime. Crime committed by those with moral imperatives. A moral imperative is something someone feels very strongly about and is something they feel they must act upon for ethical reasons. It means there's a moral principle that they need to uphold, even if this means breaking the law. In effect, this means acting according to their conscience. These motives present a limitation for ages achieving social control. And so I got them to do some research and some, make some notes um, about what crimes they were charged with and what their motives were for uh, Clive Ponting and the sinking of the General Bill, uh, Belgrano in the Falklands War um, Kay uh, Gild, uh, Gilderdale uh, with assisted suicide Rosie James and Rachel Wenham who uh, damaged uh, a nuclear submarine Alan Blythe, uh, the Suffragettes, uh, the Stansted um, 15 and so what I get them to do is I get them to research at least two of these um, and how these go into moral imperatives. What did these people believe? Obviously, the suffragettes believed in women's rights so much so they not only committed suicide, they did it publicly under horses of the king. And so therefore, that was a they broke so many laws, but they did it because they believed it was the right thing to do. And so how do you punish people like that? They're causing social mishap. They're going against social control. They're committing crimes. How do you punish that, though? So what were they charged with and what were their motives? So what was their moral imperatives? And then how were they punished? The functionalist approach to explaining crime might argue that the deviance shown by these individuals in breaking the law is sometimes necessary to cause social change or to reinforce boundary maintenance. So it's the idea that if we don't have these people committing these crimes, so for example, homosexuality might never have changed if people hadn't have stood up against it. Um, you know, if the suffragettes hadn't stood up and fought about women's rights, would we still not be able to vote to this day? So what's the difference between a terrorist somebody that causes terror for what they believe is right and somebody that breaks the law and and causes social um mishap but for the right reason so it's a very hard line to know how to treat these people so don't forget everything about this topic is about the limitations you must consider the limitations of all of them that we've just looked at um, and so what i get my students to do is i get them to rank order them which have posed the most 
significant limitations to achieving social control. I get them to rank order them and then to justify their reasons why. Hopefully you found that useful. Give me a thumbs up if you did. Don't forget to subscribe as well so you never miss out on any future postings. My plan is that I'm currently preparing a PowerPoint that goes through specifically what you need for the 2022 exams um, based on the exam board updates and announcements that have been given. Um, and so as soon as they're ready and finished, I will post the PowerPoints, then hopefully do a teach along as well. Um, I will also finish the ones for unit uh, unit four, so specifically threes. So I haven't done 3.1, 3.2 or 3.4 yet. So um, um, I will get those posted as soon as I can as well. Um, uh, otherwise, if you do have any comments or questions, please feel free to post below and I'll try and respond. Otherwise, bye for now, everyone. Thanks very much.